It's my great honor as well as my official responsibility to introduce our presidential address tonight. And as in keeping with our custom, there will be no questions following the address. I first met Vincent Wimbush long ago and far away when we were both graduate students at Harvard University in the late 1970s. Even then, it was evident that here was someone who would make his mark in the discipline of biblical studies. But I don't think anyone could have anticipated the profoundly transformative impact that his career has had and continues to have in our field. Some of you will know him as a scholar of asceticism in Greco-Roman and early Christian cultures, for he is the author or editor of some six important books on that topic. Although asceticism continues to be an active part of his research agenda, Vincent's intense focus on asceticism began in the 1980s and 1990s as part of a fundamental and transformative reevaluation of the phenomenon of asceticism. But even as he was making a distinguished reputation for himself in what many might consider a rather traditional field, Vincent was simultaneously developing a critique of the assumptions of the dominant models for doing biblical studies as a narrowly historical critical enterprise. The insight that has guided his thinking throughout his career was already expressed in an early essay from 1989. He was describing what had drawn him to biblical studies. To quote, it was neither antiquarian interests nor theological sensibilities but first the recognition of the function of the Bible among African Americans in every aspect of their existence, in every period of their history, which attracted me to biblical studies. The word function is emphasized in the text. But Vincent's observation was not just autobiographical. From his situatedness as an African American who had become a biblical scholar, he saw more broadly the need for a profound transformation of the field of biblical studies itself. He continued, failure to address the matter of the historical and contemporary cultural functions of the Bible is to fail not only to provide for the culture of intelligent laypersons a reason to engage and be influenced by biblical scholarship, it is also to fail to provide the guild of biblical scholars any clear or compelling reason for its being. Now that was perhaps a more startling claim in 1989 than it is today. Though even those who are inclined to agree with it often see the accomplishment of such a goal as far beyond their capacities as biblical scholars. But not Vincent. He embarked upon an extraordinary series of collaborative research projects, first at Union Theological Seminary and later at Claremont Graduate School, designed to bring such a vision of what it means to study scripture into being. And Vincent did not think small. From 1996 to the present, he has received grants from the Lilly Endowment, the Henry W. Luce Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, totaling by my count $2,123,000, not counting the small change. This vision is currently embodied in institutional form in the Institute for Signifying Scriptures at Claremont Graduate University. Vincent likes to refer not so much to the phenomenon of scriptures as the object of study, but of scripturalizing, that is the social scripting, psychosocial formation and power dynamics of which scriptures are always and everywhere a part. The conferences, book series, documentary films, and visiting scholar programs sponsored by the Institute are bringing into being striking new ways of conceptualizing our field. If Vincent has been integral to the transformation of the study of asceticism and to the conceptualization of scriptural and biblical studies, he has been no less instrumental in the transformation of the society of biblical literature itself. Although he has served in many, many capacities, on council, as president of a region, as SBL delegate to the ALCS, ACLS, he has remarked that he is proudest of having been the first chair of the Committee on Underrepresented Racial and Ethnic Minorities in the Profession, 1991 to 95. 
The SBL is a very different institution than it was when Vincent and I first came to its meetings. It's dramatically more diverse, not only in its ethnic, gender, and national composition, but in its thinking. And he has had a significant role in that process. In the current SBL newsletter, Vincent opens his reflections with the following statement. I'm not sure what SBL, or any other observers, should make of the election of the first person of color as president. While I suspect that it will take us some time to grasp what this moment signifies, or rather, if I may borrow Vincent's own terms, how it provides us with an opportunity for signifying the SBL in a new way. But that transformative work has begun. Finally, it's highly fitting that his presidential address should be given in the city of Atlanta. For Atlanta is Vincent's hometown, and he is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Atlanta's Morehouse College. The SBL wishes to honor our distinguished colleague and president by presenting him with a small, tangible token of our esteem. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President-elect, and thank you all. The colonial world is a Manichaean world. Franz Fanon, the wretched of the earth. Big Jim Todd was a slick black buck laying low in the mud and muck of pondy woods when the sun went down in gold and the buzzards tilted down a windless vortex to the black gum trees to sit along the quiet boughs, devout and swollen at their ease. Past midnight when the moccasin slipped from the log and trailing in its obscured waters broke the dark algae one lean bird spoke. Nigger, your breed ain't metaphysical. The buzzard coughed, his words fell in the darkness, mystic and ambrosial. But we maintain our ancient right, eat the gods by day and prophesy by night. We swing against the sky and wait. You seize the hour more passionate than strong, and strive with time to die, with time the beaked tribe's astute ally. Nigger, regard the circumstance of breath, non omnis moriar, the poet saith. Pedantic, the bird clacked its gray beak with a Tennessee accent to the classic phrase. Jim understood and was about to speak but the buzzard drooped one wing and filmed the eyes. Robert Penn Warren, Pondy Woods. Negro folklore was not a new experience for me, but it was fitting me like a tight chemise. I couldn't see it for wearing it. It was only when I was away from my native surroundings that I could see myself like somebody else and stand off and, and look at my garment. Zora Neale Hurston, Mules and Men. Well, I'm not unaware that on occasions such as this, references to the personal, and in some cases even embodiment, are quite rare. Yet I can hardly avoid transgressing in this and very likely other regards before the end of this address. In spite of what may be the testimonies of my remaining parent and other elders, and notwithstanding the certifications this state may present, my beginnings are not in this city in the sixth decade of the 20th century. In respects more profound and disturbing and poignantly ramifying for professional interpreters, my beginning should be understood to be in that far more expansive period 
and the fraught situations in the North Atlantic worlds between the 15th and 19th centuries, moments and situations in which the West and the rest were coming into fateful first contact. With such, with such contact, many social and political formations, sentiments, and orientations of the West were reforged and redefined. Contact is, of course, studied euphemy, rhetorical expression meant to veil the violence and hegemony of the West's large-scale, triangular Atlantic slave trading in dark peoples. This is the time and situation of my beginning, and it is the touchstone for the consciousness and challenge that I bring to this podium this night. And I think almost all of you have beginnings like my own. In fact, I would be excited about engaging any of you who would claim to be untouched by the dynamics of this period. The dynamics now still largely determine, even haunt, I would argue, are sometimes different but also common positionalities and orientations, practices, discourses, ideologies, politics, social formations, including, uh, included in the haunting are, of course, the profound shifts in the understanding of the self, including ideas about freedom and slavery of the self that have marked this period. Although differently named and tweaked from decade to decade since 1880, those practices and discourses that define this professional society have always been or, and are even now still fully imbricated in the general politics and emergent discourses of the larger period to which I refer. And the cultivated obliviousness to or silence about, if not also the ideological validation of the larger prevailing currents and dynamics that mark this larger period, are part of the history of this society. With its fetishization of and preoccupations with the rituals and games involving books and, of course, the book, with its politics of feigning an apolitical ideology, its simple historicist agenda mixed from time to time with unclaimed, unacknowledged theological interests, its commitment to sticking to the text, its orientation in reality has always contributed to and reflected a kind of participation in sticking it to the gendered and racialized others. The fragility of the fiction of the apolitical big tent holding us together is all too evident in the still mind-numbingly vapid language we use to describe our varied practices, ideologies, and orientations. Of course, there have been challenges to the society and its orientations uh, in many periods uh, in its history. You know what they have been. But you will not be surprised if I suggest that the challenges have been too, far, too few and too tepid and always belated. The fact that we cannot today document the membership and participation of a single African American in this society before the fifth decade of the 20th century, the fact that the most recent history of SBL in observance of its centennial does not even mention black membership or a black member. The fact that we cannot point to the official regularly scheduled gathering of, let's say, two or three African Americans in official discourse before the eighth decade of the last century is, of course, shocking. Only with the initiatives of Thomas Hoyt, Jr., then at Hartford, and John W. Waters, then at ITC in the 1980s, which led to the Stony the Road project in the late 1980s, which in turn led to the establishment of the first honestly ethnically marked program unit, African Americans in the title, that 
pave the way for all such units uh, that exist today, only with such initiatives do black peoples and other peoples of color appear in numbers and make a point at all about racial ethnic diversity in SBL. In other words, this was the period of my initiation and participation in society. This belated presence, which suggests much about the timing of someone of my tribe standing before you this evening. Well, perhaps it, it could not have been otherwise. I do not presume that black peoples were between the 1880s and the 1980s barred from membership and participation on the various campuses and hotels that were venues of the meetings. I do not imagine the chairs of the Synoptic Gospels group or the Ugaritic Studies seminars, units standing at the doors yelling whites only. I suspect something deeper and even more troubling was and perhaps remains even today. Given the state of emergency in which they have lived, emergencies of the sort that would make Walter Benjamin sit up and take notice, given the onset of the second slavery in the post-Civil War era when the industrial liberal North threw black folk under the wagon and the South intensified its racial violence and its the worst practices of Jim Crowism, I suspect that the reason had to do with something else entirely that might be expressed in the vernacular of the folk that the society needed, quote, to be talking about something in order for that membership profile to change. Notwithstanding all the historical and some continuing stumbling blocks along the way, I suggest that paucity of black membership may be due ultimately not to bad faith and bad manners of members of society in the past, but around this something more, the discursive practices that have defined and continue to define the society. So it is imperative, I think, that we recognize, even if belatedly, those few pioneers of the decades before the initiatives of Hoyt and Waters, the likes of Leon Edward Wright, first we can account for membership, Charles B. Kofer, G. Murray Branch, Joseph A. Johnson, we must inscribe them and a few others like them into our organizational consciousness and memory so that they might appropriately haunt and inspire us. They struggled mightily to figure out how to speak to challenges and pressures of the different worlds they intersected as black male intellectuals on the peripheries of this field. They were not always understood by members of their own tribes because so many parts of society and academy accepted segregation as just the way things were. They all worked in black institutions, mostly in Atlanta and Washington. And the society barely recognizing them, barely understanding their presence as concept, did little to support them or resist the polluted status quo they must surely have exhausted themselves. They surely had stories to tell, lessons and challenges for us all. And of course, that our sisters of color who faced even more layered intersecting stumbling blocks to their participation, that they emerged at all in the 1980s and are here among us in great numbers, in greater numbers, is tribute to their strength and commitment and further evidence of the society's fraught and frayed history. Now, after having left home in that flatter sense of the term, or in Zora Neale Hurston's terms, having loosened the grip of that hyper-racialized garment I was made to wear, and with growing awareness of what I gained from some of these pioneers, uh, 
and through engagement of that fraught period of first contact as intense excavation of consciousness, I stand before you this evening with, with yet another challenge, imploring the society and by extension all critical interpreters to start and to sustain talking about something in the way that the folk registered the matter. Now here's the challenge plainly put. There can be no critical interpretation worthy of the name and the basic general claims of criticism without our coming to terms with the problematics of the first contact between the West and the rest, the West and others, and the perduring toxic and blinding effects and consequences of the matter. The challenge remains for this society and all collectivities of critical interpreters to engage in persistent and protracted struggle, not symbolic or obfuscating games around methods and approaches, but struggle to come to terms with the construal of the modern ideologization of language, here characterized by the meta-racism that marks the relationship between European dominance and peoples of color. What might it mean to address in explicit terms the nature and consequences of first contact for the unstable and fragile big tent that is our society? What might it suggest for the ongoing, widely, differently prioritized and oriented work we do in our different settings and contexts with our nonetheless still widely shared elitist claims and presumptions about such work. It would make it imperative that we talk about discourse and power, slavery and freedom, life and death. In addition to the persons quoted at the beginning of this address, I've given myself permission tonight to conjure one of those booming, haunting voices from an earlier moment in that period of first contact. A voice belonging to one among those people heavily signified. One, as W.E.B. Du Bois put it, uh, who was uh, a voice within the veil. Unlike Warren's Big Jim referred to in the poem read earlier, in his 1845 narrative, Frederick Douglass looks back on an incident from his youthful years when he was a slave. The incident as type was seemingly a recurring one, but he makes the reader experience it as a regular pointed one for narratological effect. It's an incident that Douglass, the recently escaped and young but emerging lion-voiced abolitionist, remembers and recounts for the assumed mostly white abolitionist-minded reader. What he touches upon and opens up in an astonishing display of romanticist and critical reflexive communication are several issues that likely escaped the review or were not or perhaps could not be fully understood by the Garrisonians, the abolitionist patronizers of the young slave. These were issues that still offer pointed challenge to all moderns, especially those interested and invested in thinking about something, that is about the enslaved, enslaved thinking, critical and free interpretation. And so I quote Douglas. The slaves selected to go to the Great House farm for the monthly allowance for themselves and their fellow slaves would make the dense woods for miles around reverberate with their wild songs, revealing at once the highest joy and the deepest sadness. They would compose and sing as they went along, consulting neither time nor tune. The thought that came up came out, if not in the word, in the sound and as frequently in the one as in the other, they would sometimes sing the most pathetic sentiment in the most rapturous tone, and the most rapturous sentiment in the most pathetic tone. Into all of their songs, they would manage to weave something of the great house form. Especially would they do this 
when leaving home. They would then sing most exultingly, words which to many would seem unmeaning jargon, but which nevertheless were full of meaning to themselves. I did not, when a slave, understand the deep meaning of those rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle so that I neither saw nor heard as those without might see and hear. In this recounting, Douglas names many issues for consideration, subjectivity and consciousness, discourse power, knowledge and center, knowledge and the centers. He also names at least three different categories of persons or groups as different types of knowers or interpreters produced by that world of fraught contact. First, the slave singers, those who through their songs provide evidence that they have some knowledge and some agency of communication, but who are nonetheless not allowed to communicate their knowledge and sentiment beyond their own immediate circle. Second, those outside the circle, the world associated with the Great House Farm and all that it represents. Those who, if they hear the slave songs at all, hear them only as jargon, as what Ishmael Reed called mumbo jumbo. And third, there was Douglas himself, the one who, although technically at first within the circle, who as such did not, could not know, then begins to understand his writerly self outside the circle begins to understand more of what the slaves felt and communicated. But even more than that, he began to understand something about communication itself, knowledge itself. He uses African slaves to think with. He thinks in terms of sight as insight, uh, sight in terms of types of consciousness and interpreters the enslaving, the enslaved, and the runagate. These categories I submit, and I think Douglas thought, were not always totally mutually exclusive. They can be in history and have been complexly intertwined, yet there's justification for their isolation for the sake of a particular kind of analysis. There is no escape from the consequences set in motion by that contact that was turned into violent conquest for some and long-term subordination for the many others. Douglass's wrenching passage about the black slaves he knew and the types of interpreters and consciousness that could be identified with them challenges all interpreters to seek a way out, a way to run. His analysis begins complexly emotionally um, with those whose very identity as human agents was questioned and denied. He begins with physical enslavement as a way to get to the problematization of what Houston Baker calls the black hole, that is to a profound understanding of the larger complex of slavery and freedom that defines and marks all of us. To these three categories of interpreters I briefly turn. First, the enslaving. <clears throat> Those participating in and profiting from the structure of dominance generated by the great house farm culture were understood by Douglas to be oblivious to the plight of others. They were imagined to be those who, like Warren's buzzard, lifted the wings so as to avoid seeing and hearing those others. They were also characterized, according to Fanon, as those who had fallen prey to a Manichaean psychology and epistemics. The world was understood to be black and white, the latter signifying light and purity and life, the farmer, dirt and pollution. Of course, we now know more about what subtends such psychology and epistemics since Melville and other raging mad souls we now know that it represents a horrific splitting of the self into the blankness of whiteness and the foreboding, threatening, overdetermined marketness of blackness. It also represents the hardened essentialization of these parts. The splitting is traumatic. 
It is not recognized or acknowledged, really. It is part of the phenomenon of the hidden brain. It results in the meta-racist regime that pollutes all of us, infects our discourses, our work, our play, including even philological play. It was at work in Jefferson's convoluted denial of Phyllis Wheatley's brilliant artistry. It was at work in Hegel's disavowal of the successful struggle of those black folk in Haiti against their enslavers and the meaning of such struggle as the backdrop for his own theorizing about the dialectics of struggle between master and slave. It also provokes his further denial of the meaning of this struggle for the modern, most powerful modern representation of radical universalism and the turn to modernity. It was at work in John Locke's politics of language found in his project of the purification of language. It was part of the insidious meta-discursive formation aimed to deny the right to public speech to anyone, women, serfs, sub-aristocratic whites, who could not speak properly or on his terms. We see it in the work in Supreme Court Justice Robert Taney's remark that the unhappy black nations are doomed to slavery, that they have no rights which the white man was bound to respect. It was at work when the white evangelical Tony Perkins of the Family Council declared on CNN the last presidential election cycle with great authority and without a whiff of qualification, much like Warren's buzzard, that the Jeremiads of the urban black pastor named Jeremiah were unscriptural. Can we doubt that Perkins' utterance comes out of the still regnant Manichaean world? Is it hard to see in his mind, buried far in that hidden brain where meta-racism thrives, that there is an assumption that he and his tribesmen own the Bible and that they are invested with all rights and privileges appertaining thereto, meaning control, for our sake, of the discourses about the Bible. Who cannot see that behind his outburst are exegetical arguments legitimized by scholarship of our membership, wittingly and even more dangerously, sometimes unwittingly, that conjure the ancient Near East as a biblical world that is a white world in seamless historical development with the modern world? These and other examples of disavowals and tortured silences Twisted arguments and declarations reflect the pollution and veiling of humanity and consciousness that is the Manichaean construction. It is arguable that it is no longer possible for those who are subject to such a construction or regime to argue freely what they see, what they know, what they think or feel. Having to make, for example, black always signify the same things, always signify a sort of negative, represents a tremendous psychosocial and intellectual commitment and burden. This mentality of denial and disavowal, the most trenchant reflection of the Manichaean, has been powerfully imaged in the frontispiece to Jesuit scholar Joseph Francois Lavital's 1725 multi-volume work Meurs de Sauvage Américain, and he compared the savages in the ancient world to the modern world. Following Berger's interpretive glosses on the image, we see the racialized and gendered, anthropomorphized father, time, and death intersected with an effort to write a different history. So a writer anthropomorphized as woman European within and for the larger framework that is Europe ascendant writes in order to clarify in light of the contact with the others the resultant changes in the world. 
how the world must be seen. She writes about the truth as Europeans must see it and tell it and know it. So notice along the bottom of the image, objects, trinkets, fetishes, the history, the truth that is to be told about savages and primitives must now be told in terms of a method of bricolage reflecting a radical Manichaean psychology. The savage could not possibly communicate deserves no hearing, demands no respectful gaze. So who enslaves whom? Douglas implied that those far outside the circle, those in some respect participating in the ways of the Great House Farm, those who like the woman representing Euro-America writing up the rest, can hardly see or hear, much less understand the rest like the poignantly named Nehemiah who writes up Dessa in Shirley Williams' novel Dessa Rose, the writer makes up a truth like a kind of science. The writing represents a kind of violence do done to Dessa's body. The woman who is Euro-America writes up the savages and actually does not even look at the objects and symbols assumed to represent them. Her gaze <coughs> redefines what it means to see straight. Second, the enslaved. They were denied the main currents of communication and social exchange. They were considered chattel, so it was assumed they were unable to think or communicate, part of the ways of the swinish multitude that Edmund Burke identified. They were presumed not to be able to read or and write, at least not in canonical cosmopolitan European languages or modes. Douglas knew that the black enslaved could make meaning or make things mean, but not beyond their immediate circle. Outside their circle, they experienced little or no intersubjectivity. And so he did not over romanticize that situation. This was indeed to be one of the most important meanings and consequences of enslavement that their language was an anti-language, unrecognized and unacknowledged. This is what Douglas referred to as the unmeaning jargon. They were rendered ultimately silent and invisible. Ralph Ellison's character in Invisible Man has put the phenomenon in the most riveting terms. I am invisible, he says, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. The evidence of the silencing and invisibility is everywhere to be seen. Consider Rebecca Pronton, an 18th century pioneer, Moravian missionary and evangelist, and founder of one of the first African American congregations in the North Atlantic world. She's largely been forgotten. Consider the woman known only as Sister Frances or as the Blackie Moore maid. Her well-known charismatic leadership in the establishment of the 17th century Protestant formation that became the Church of Christ in Broadmead, later Broadmead Baptist Church in Bristol, was erased by Edward Terrell's establishment revisionist history. Her leadership was reduced to overdetermined categories and sentimentality. She was literally by the pen erased out of her rightful place in history as a powerful founding figure. And Douglas's own situation as writer is worth mentioning. The abolitionist William Lord Garrison who provided the preface to Douglas's 1845 narrative. Whatever may be said about the substantive comments made in the preface, it is clear that it functioned primarily to translate Douglas, to provide meta-commentary for all that was to follow. This is an example of enslavement as a kind of framing. A discerning reader can determine whether Garrison ever really understood Douglas's text. Douglas later severed ties with Garrison and the Garrisonians. He came to understand how slavery could continue to wake to work way up north as discursive framing. Perhaps the most famous description, if not final analysis, of the phenomenon of the enslaved as the frame 
can be found in Du Bois's work. In Slaves of Black Folk, the Manichaean world is the world of the veil that's defined by racial division that pollutes and infects all. There is almost no intellectual life or point of transference, he says, where the thoughts and feelings of one race can come into direct contact and sympathy with the thoughts and feelings of the other. As Douglas looked back to the Great House Farm, he does not romanticize the situation. He indicates that he'd come to understand that the chief dilemma that the slaves faced was not really the physical domination, as demeaning as it was, but it had to do with not being seen or heard, not being understood, not being able to communicate with human dignity. Enslavement meant being able to sing a bit, perhaps, but only within the Manichaean prescribed circle in which black was overdetermined, as among other things, unmeaning jargon. This was for Douglas intolerable. He would escape it. So that brings me to the third category, renegade. Alternate form of renegade from Middle Latin renegatus, meaning fugitive or runaway, it has come to carry the meaning of a more transgressive act than mere flight. It is marinage. It is a running away with attitude and a plan, a taking flight in body, but even more in terms of consciousness. We know that Douglas literally runs away from enslavement or a form of it. It is as runagate that he writes his story. And in this part of the story about the slaves on their way to the Great House Farm, Douglas distinguishes himself from the others who are slaves still. He seems to experience being in and out of solidarity with them, in and out of related consciousness with them. He knows them, but he is also alien to them. That he once occupied a psychic position similar to them, but now assumes a different position is excruciatingly painful for him. He registers anxiety experienced over the need to step outside the circle, outside the framed experience or consciousness. He is a runagate before he runs away. There's a long history of this phenomenon of the runagate, long before and long after Douglas among the people who whom we now call African Americans. The runagate not only involved heroic individuals such as Douglas, but everyday folk of the collective who showed themselves to be a people on the run, a marooned people intent on moving from dry places, fields of enslavement to higher places for higher purpose taking flight, running away in several different respects of meaning and, and experience was the watchword. It brought some of my relatives to this city and took some others into other parts of the country. That other famous philosopher called Locke, as in Elaine, in his 1925 edited volume, The New Negro vividly captured the impetus and drama of one of the waves of runagates in the 20th century. I quote, the wash and rush of this human tide is to be explained primarily in terms of a new vision of opportunity. With each excessive wave of it, the movement of the Negro becomes more and more a mass movement toward the larger and more democratic chance, a deliberate flight not only from the countryside to city, but from medieval America to modern. Jacob Lawrence's visualization of the phenomenon brilliantly captures these sentiments. The critical sign of Douglas having already become runagate before reaching the North is his acquisition and uses literacy. Having learned to read had to do with more than learning the letters, being given the inch, as he called it, his reading involved taking the L and beyond. That is a much more complex phenomenon with profound consequences 
far beyond those feared by the masters. His command of text is like Blanchot's notion of reading as reading past the text to the work. There is a reading of a complex self, an historicized self. The self that Douglas began to read seems to be the result of a splitting of a different sort from, but with great implications and ramifications for the engagement of Manichaean psychology. Douglas continued to run, and here again Du Bois provides helpful perspective. His references in Souls of Black Folk to the veil as metaphor would name the nature of the construction of the Manichaean world and his understanding of consequences and the impact. It's, it's the famous passage that you know, that peculiar sensation, double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. Now this passage is generally assumed to apply simply and universally to all black peoples in the United States. But this interpretation is questionable as applied to souls of black folk. Um, souls of black folks was focused on explaining to a mixed readership those black folks who were physically and increasingly psychically removed from the world of the Great House Farm, who were now facing the negotiation of a larger miscegenated world and consciousness. For such persons like Douglas, himself outside the circle, he understood that what was experienced most acutely is a splitting and acute self-alienation, a dissociation. This is what he termed existence beyond the veil of color in souls of black folk. Of course, the debate about what this means and how this was experienced will continue uh, to rage. In fact, um, <clears throat> one wing of interpretation has led to an understanding that, um, in fact, the response should be uh, construed in the terms associated with Martin Delaney and Marcus Garvey when they declared themselves and black peoples in general to be moderns with no truck with the past. So Douglass's miscegenated and alienated consciousness led him to wage battle, to want to run. It was the fight with Covey, the infamous nigger breaker, that sharply reflected Douglass's struggle with this alienation. Douglass understood the fight with Covey to be more than physical contact. In Covey, Douglas comes face to face, so to speak, with the more tangible manifestations of meta-racism, the system and its imbrication of Christian ideology, teaching. It also occasioned opportunity for Douglas to represent his confrontation with the world of the slave, more specifically African traditions represented by Sandy the Root Doctor. Like Jacob's wrestling with the angel, Douglas fights an existential battle. He fights against aspects of himself that had been forced to split on a kind of Manichaean meta-racism. He fights the white side of himself, represented by Covey and his absent father, which derides and demeans and denies him. He fights the black side of himself, represented by Sandy, with that limited agency and communication and skills some timidity, perhaps even perfidy. He shows himself to be conscious of the tightly controlled, tightly coiled constructedness of both worlds. In the end, he fights, and he, this fight results in his becoming a subjectivity that was miscegenated, but not merely a blending in literal or physical terms, but an independent self that was now unstable, fluid, protean, embattled, split from the framing. It was this splitting and anxiety over it that Du Bois considered an opportunity and a gift to black subjects and through them to the larger world. The forced splitting provides opportunity for cultivation of heightened critical consciousness. I read from Du Bois's The Concept of Race. Once in a while, he said, 
noting that the phenomenon was not guaranteed but had to be cultivated and exploited, through all of us, that is, those forced behind the veil, that sheet of invisible, horribly tangible plate glass limbing a dark cave, this situation within which black folks are entombed souls, hindered in their natural movement, expression, and development, once in a while, he continues, there flashes some clairvoyance, some clear idea of what America really is. We who are dark, he concludes, can see America in a way that America cannot. In learning to read not just text, but texture and world, including what Covey represented in the world, but also in the same scene, what Sandy represented in the world, Douglas had escaped from the cave, from the tight circle. Now what might these arguments and perspectives mean for the society of biblical literature? How could its discourses and practices not be fully implicated in the reflection of the Manichaean ideology and epistemics? In what respects uh, might its epistemics be different from that of a Tony Perkins or a Thomas Jefferson? How can the ever more sophisticated methods and approaches of the operations of the society's diverse members focused on a single, at most two complexly interwoven texts or traditions, avoid functioning as apologetics for the nation or the empire and their satellite orders? How can the society avoid making and keeping the scriptures and all the characters in them white like Ahab's whale, or white like the color of Perkins' ancient Near Eastern world. Well, Douglas hints at this way out. He argues the critical interpreter must escape, must run, must be outside the circle. His own experience as scriptural reader is a direct challenge. Before he escaped in literal terms, he started a secret seminary or religious studies program. He called it a Sabbath school. This was for groups of slaves from various neighboring plantations. He indicated in somewhat veiled terms that his motive had to do with more than teaching letters. We were trying, he said, to learn how to read the will of God. That is to read life and death, slavery and freedom right there. He helped establish a safe zone within which the students could learn, think, talk among themselves. In direct opposition to the expectations and interests of the masters, and as a practice reflecting what Michael Tausick calls mimetic excess, this scripture reading practice reflected self-reflexivity, a heightened consciousness of what he was doing, of his imitating the other and with a difference. He knew that the reading of the scriptures was hardly ever mere reading of an ancient world, but it was about the life of slaves running toward freedom. Douglas positioned himself to read and to help others to read uh, both worlds, both levels. Can the members of this society claim that kind of consciousness? Can they claim to be in solidarity with a statement attributed to Sojourner Truth that she, like Douglas, they were not readers of small stuff, that is of letters, but of people and nations. He was not so much reading scriptures as he was reading or signifying on the regime of reading scriptures, a kind of scripturalization. He was reading the regime that creates and enforces uses of scriptures, like Kafka's ape, aping high-minded humans, he showed his thinking about thinking. Surely here's a challenge to a different critical orientation, an orientation to scripture study as part of, as fully part of the human sciences, with investment in critical histories that aim to make sense of what subtends the practices, the forms of expression, the various relations of power. 
It makes sense, of course, with all the pain and trauma involved for the black self always to want to run, to let go. There is no advantage, no life in not running. But the impetus to run, to let go, is not very strong for those who are strongly positioned within the Manichaean framework. Such hidden brain fundamentalism around which much of the Euro-American world is built is so deeply buried, so tightly coiled, so persistent, that nothing less than shock can dislodge it. Although a renegade member of a different academic professional, Michael Tausick makes of himself a poignant and perhaps painful example and lesson for our consideration. At one point, he set, accepts himself as a white man from the world of the Great House Farm and its culture. He reacts to an image presented that reflects uh, the ways of uh, the white man, the ways of the white man in the context of a shrine in Nigeria. And this briefly is what Michael Tausig says about the other's representation of the white other. He frightens me, this African man. He unsettles, he makes me wonder without end. Was the world historical power of whiteness achieved through its being a sacred as well as profane power? It makes me wonder about the constitution of whiteness as global colonial work and also as a minutely psychic one involving psychic powers invisible to my senses. It is the West now face to face with itself, the white man facing himself. Such face to faceness brings its quotient of self-congratulation. They think we are gods, but being a god is okay as long as it isn't excessive. After all, who knows, in imagining us as gods, might they not take our power? Douglas's insurgent seminary sessions, Tausig's training in African School of Arts and Criticism, suggests for SBL the imperative of seeing scriptural reading as, an, as a real part of a mimetic system of discourse and power. The critic should see his or her own critical practices as part of that greater framing system and seek to find um, an identity that's other than fixed. It's the fixed identity that needs uh, the fixed canon. How could SBL not be so oriented in the 21st century that it would fail to see the importance of the politics of canonical identity formation in relationship to the formation of canonical texts. How can we remain a society only of biblical literature and not a society of scriptures more generally, including not merely the other major religious systems of the world and their scriptures, but also the little systems and the myriad forms and representations of scriptures in the world. How can we not move in this direction in this century of globalizations? How exciting and compelling and renegade would be a society of interpreters that excavates all representations of scriptures in terms of discourse and power. But this requires letting go of unmarked or blank whiteness and of a forced essential blackness on account of forced placement in a zone of non-subjectivity. My tribe has always given birth to artists, poets, shamans, diviners who capture us as renegades and constantly challenge us to remain so. They show us the way of the double-sided, the way of those who know that knowing requires occupying a zone where there is constant shifting in authorial consciousness, a site on which radical translation and transformation always has to be worked on, a site where, according to Ralph Ellison, black is and black ain't, because black can make you and black can unmake you. It means letting go of closed systems of cultural authority and of claims to being overseers 
of texts. Those folk who have been placed behind the veil challenge all of us to run, in fact, to run continuously from the cave into the zone of marinage. Now listen how two Atlanta-based bards or shamans of different generations put the matter in brief. Oh, you better run, better run, better run. Ah, you better run. Finally, the famous poet Robert Hayden, his poem Runagate, has woven together perhaps the classic expressions and images of the black cultural sentiments regarding the Runagate. The second stanza, he refers to Harriet Tubman as the one who leads the people um, out of the cave, out of the mire, into a better situation. Wanted Harriet Tubman, alias the general, alias Moses, stealer of slaves, in league with Garrison, Alcott, Emerson, Garrett, Douglas, Thoreau, John Brown, armed and known to be dangerous, wanted, reward, dead or alive. Come ride on my train, oh that train, ghost story train, through swamp and savanna, movering, movering, over trestles of dew, through caves of the wish, Midnight special on a saber track, movering, movering, come right on my train, mean, mean, mean to be free. The folk who are dark challenge us to run away from the feigned solid canonical self onto the ghost story train into what Toni Morrison calls a disrupting darkness, down into what Howard Thurman calls a luminous darkness where the process of the hard work of self-criticism can take place. They also warn us that ultimately there is no other way out. That must have been what the unknown bards, the song poets meant when they crafted and sang, it's so high you can't get over it, it's so low you can't get under it, so round you can't get around it, you must go through the door. We may not, need not all talk that talk, talk like that, but we all for the sake of being a compelling force as a learned society focused on the ultimate problematics of discourse and power must start and sustain talking about something, about slavery and freedom, life and death. Thank you very much.